From her ashes will arise the knowledge. From her fate, the legend. Okay, sure, the airship was burning. Was it uh, being fueled by the hydrogen, or was it being fueled by something else? The speed of the fire, together with its distinctive orange color, were clues that something else on board the Hindenburg was highly flammable, quite apart from the hydrogen. As well as the aluminium frame, the airship was built of wood, cotton fiber, and other materials that would burn easily and give the fire an orange appearance. But what particularly attracted Bain's attention was the incredible speed with which the outer cover of the ship had burned. He calculated the flame front along the outside had advanced as fast as 15 meters per second. The fire went so fast through there, it came out of there like a blowtorch. Within five seconds, the whole top was gone. It was so fast. It only took 34 seconds to burn. I mean, it just blew right out of there. The outer cover was a key feature of Zeppelin airship technology. Designed to give the ship an aerodynamic profile, it also had to be waterproof and reflective to prevent the hydrogen from expanding through overheating. Zeppelin's engineers achieved this by painting the cover with a doping compound containing a cocktail of chemicals, and had developed a new formula specifically for the Hindenburg. Could those chemicals explain the speed of the fire? Searching through the archives, Bain found hints that changes had been made to the Hindenburg's doping compound, but he struggled to find hard information. Well, it was a mystery in itself. I had gone through five different archives, thousands of pages of information. I accumulated uh, libraries from other people, experts on airships, collectors, purchased many, many books on airships, and read through them. and frankly could not find specifically what was used to coat the Hindenburg. Bain felt sure the official hydrogen theory was fatally flawed. He suspected the speed and color with which the outer cover had burned was the key to the disaster, but he couldn't prove it. An amazing piece of luck was about to deliver the breakthrough he was looking for. The on hydrogen looked fatally flawed. Addison Bain felt sure the truth lay in the airship's outer cover, but without hard data, he would never be able to prove it. The breakthrough came when I was attending a hydrogen conference in Cocoa Beach. And I saw this gentleman walking around with an airship book under his arm, and I walked over to him and I says, uh, may I see that airship book? And he introduced himself as Richard Van Truen. He says he was looking for Addison Bain to talk about hydrogen. I said, well, I'm here. <laughs> Now, tell me about this. Richard Van Truren is an airship enthusiast with a huge range of contacts in the airship community. He was fascinated to learn about Bain's new theory. Well, up until the point of our meeting, Dr. Bain had not been able to find specific information about the Zeppelin's outer covering. Nothing has been published about it. So I was able to introduce him to a Mr. Hepburn Walker, a World War II airshipman that had saved actual samples of the Hindenburg fabric from where she fell. Well, I try to get samples of any airship that's particularly rigid airships. I got samples of the girders for the Los Angeles, the ZMC-2 metal-clad airship. The Hindenburg, of course, is the most famous airship in history. And I figured, well, I'd want a few samples of the girder work and the fabric work. And it, I went out there and scuffed my foot and dug up pieces of fabric and so on. Remarkably, fragments of the outer cover had survived the blaze and were strewn across the landing site at Lakehurst. Oh, when I found that there were some fabric samples, that were remnants of the Hindenburg, I was, a, uh, I was ecstatic. <laughs> I said, I know how to go find out what's on, in, the, in those materials, you know. The existence of genuine Hindenburg samples proved a key breakthrough. It meant for the first time, Bain could study the chemical makeup of the outer cover and discover what might have made it burn so quickly. Examining the fabric first under an electron microscope, then using infrared spectroscopy, he was able to determine the precise mix of chemicals used in the doping compound. Okay, there we go. And this is the band we were looking for. That, that's the important yes. part right here. What, what is that showing there? He found that iron oxide and powdered aluminium were all part of the doping mixture. Being associated with space shuttle uh, activity, I knew that 
powdered aluminum was the fuel used on the, on the boosters. And I thought, boy, what a bad combination. The external boosters on the space shuttle are powered by a solid rocket propellant driven by both aluminium powder and iron oxide. Yet the experiments confirmed that precisely these same ingredients were present in even greater quantities in the chemicals used to protect the Hindenburg's outer cover. The outer cover was similar chemically to solid rocket fuel. Was that flammable cocktail of chemicals the key to what really happened? To prove that, Bain would need to fit in a final piece of the jigsaw and explain how the fire had started. The US Air Force's research laboratories in Ohio are the United States' leading center for the study of the physical forces affecting aircraft, researching plane crashes like the TWA 800 accident. One key team here specializes in the dangers of sparks being formed by electrostatic charges in the atmosphere. Go ahead and bring the voltage up. As an aircraft flies through the atmosphere, it actually can build up a static charge on the surface of the aircraft from what we call P-static or precipitation static, and that's just flowing through the atmosphere. That kind of static buildup would apply as much to an airship as to any other aircraft. But of equal importance, the Hindenburg's landing at Lakehurst that day had been delayed due to bad weather, and the airship had rushed into land between two large electrical storm fronts. There were thunderstorms in the vicinity, which meant that uh, the atmosphere probably was increasingly charged. This could be a factor in putting a substantial charge on the surface of the Hindenburg, more so than on a regular day. Yet this had all been anticipated by Zeppelin's engineers. The internal frame of the airship was designed to be electrically bonded, so that any charge it was carrying would have flowed to Earth the moment the landing lines touched the ground, without any risk of a spark. You have to have, electrically, a good conductive path so if you get charging on an aircraft, or if an aircraft gets struck by lightning, that the high currents or the high voltage buildup will have a good electrical low resistive path to flow on and off the aircraft. But while investigating the design of the outer cover, Addison Bain discovered that the Hindenburg would not have been properly bonded. The outer cover was made of individual panels of doped cloth attached to the main frame of the airship by light cords. These cords were poor electrical conductors, making it difficult for any charge carried on the panels from running off to Earth. But that day, it had been raining. Some of the cords would be wet, making them more conductive than others, and thereby bonding them electrically to the rest of the airship. Any electricity on the bonded panels would safely have run off the ship when the landing lines were released but some panels would have remained electrically isolated, retaining a huge voltage which would seek the easiest possible route to Earth. Eventually, the voltage difference between those panels and the earthed frame would be so great that an electric spark could leap across the gap between the two, allowing the electricity to discharge. Clearly visible under the electron microscope, the aluminium particles in the outer covering's doping compound would be a good conductor for that discharging electricity. Electrostatic charge has an affinity or an attraction to powdered aluminum. So once that reaction starts, then the aluminum gets extremely hot, of course, and it's in, in a very flammable environment, namely the, the cloth and the, the dope that's used on the cover. What's important there is the combination of those ingredients it can be almost explosive. That electrical current discharging through the cover would also generate heat, enough to set the highly flammable aluminium alight, the trigger for the ensuing blaze. Zeppelin would not have realized they were playing with fire. They had used the aluminium powder because it was an excellent reflector of the sun's heat, but little was known at the time of its flammable properties, and particularly how prone it is to ignition in the presence of electricity. <laughs> 